This is Matt Walsh, and he is the head of the School of Journalism, Medium and Media and Culture at Cardiff University in the UK. That's in Wales. He specializes in teaching TV and digital news. And before coming in, becoming an academic, he worked as a journalist for more than 20 years at The Times, the BBC, ITN, and Al Jazeera. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and, and Matt will answer them at the end, toward the end of his session. And we're gonna go for 45 minutes. So here we go. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Jackie. Yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Matt Walsh and uh, as Jackie says, I'm head of the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at uh, Cardiff University here in the UK. So uh, beaming in from across, across the, the Atlantic. Uh, if you don't already know, uh, Cardiff is the capital city of Wales. Here it is in, in the map. Uh, and Wales is one of the nations that are united in the United Kingdom of Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. So um, don't refer to us as England, we're the UK. So um, the UK, uh, what's Wales famous for? Wales is famous for rugby. You might recognize the shape of the ball there. It looks a little bit familiar. We're also famous for uh, singing, castles, and dragons. In fact, we like dragons so much, we actually even put one of them on our flag. Uh, so um, Cardiff University, we're uh, one of the biggest and most successful uh, in the UK. Our journalism school is amongst the best in the world. Uh, I would say that though, wouldn't I? Uh, it's currently ranked in the top 25 of global universities for communications and media. And our alumni have uh, even risen to prominence over there in the US as well. For example, James Goldston, who's president of ABC News, is one of our former graduate students. Now, during the next half hour or so, I'm gonna be talking to you about how we cover politics on TV in the UK. I'll talk about how we do it, why it's different to the United Kingdom, uh, United States rather, uh, and why both constitutional change here in the UK and the use of social media is changing the way that TV political journalists work and is adding to some of the pressures that they face. But let's start with the politics. So it's sometimes said that Britain and America are two countries divided by a common language. And the same may be true of our politics. Now, both the UK and the US are democracies, but their approaches to democracy are quite different. And if you think about that, that makes quite a lot of sense, right? Because the founding fathers created a constitution that defined itself by its break from the British system of crown and parliament. Now, there have been innovations and changes during the centuries, but the basic systems are still quite different. Now, the UK has a bicameral national legislature. That's a lower and an upper house, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now that might sound quite familiar. It sounds a little bit like the Congress and House of Representatives in the Senate. And we, had a he uh, we have a head of state too. For almost the last 70 years, that's been Queen Elizabeth II. You may have seen her aging over a few seasons on Netflix. But in the British system, most of the power resides in the lower house, the House of Commons. Now, it's the Commons that proposes laws and most of the senior ministers will be elected to the Commons as well, including the Prime Minister, currently Boris Johnson, who you can see here with his shock of blonde hair. Traditionally, the Prime Minister is the leader of the largest political party in the Commons, but unlike the President in the US, they're not directly elected by the whole of the population. The House of Lords, can, with the upper house, can rev review and revise new laws, but in most cases, it will not introduce legislation or block a government's election promises. And that's because the Lords are almost all appointed for life. They don't contest public elections. There are also a few hereditary peers. Those are a throwback to an earlier time when the Lords were all aristocrats who inherited both their wealth and a seat in Parliament. And of course, the Sovereign sits at the top of, tr of the tree. While in theory, she has some power. In fact, almost all of the powers of the Crown are given to the Prime Minister to use as they choose. This is called the uh, Royal Prerogative, and it includes things like the power to make war or to make peace. So let's just take a quick look at the detail of the, the British parliamentary system. The House of Commons has 650 parliamentary seats or constituencies. Every five years, the members of parliament are chosen in a general election. And each one of the 650 seats is an individual contest. Whoever gets the most votes wins the seat. This is sometimes called first past the post, as there's no other balancing through proportional representation. Win 326 seats or more, and you can form the government. Now, in the House of Lords, the upper house, there are currently 834 peers. I say currently, as the number keeps increasing, as the Prime Minister of the day can appoint new peers, and they often do that either as a reward for their supporters or to gain power advantage in the upper house. Uh, 
Of that 834 lords, 92 are hereditary peers, those are aristocratic throwbacks, and 26 are bishops or archbishops of the Church of England. Not terribly democratic, you might think. And you'd be right. Now, there have been lots of attempts to reform the House of Lords. The current settlement was an invention by, of the Labour government led by Tony Blair in the 1990s. But to date, we've never actually got as far uh, as electing the upper house. And just to complicate things further, the UK has also devolved some powers from the UK wide government to the three national legislatures, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly. This isn't a federal system but one where certain powers are passed from the UK government to local administrations. And the three legislatures have authority over different areas of policy. For example, the Scottish Parliament has wider powers and a larger budget than the Welsh Parliament, but they tend to look after issues such as health and transport, while powers over taxation, defence and foreign affairs uh, tend to stay with the UK government. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly is, is a bit of a different beast. It's a system that was set up to allow power sharing between the nationalist and the unionist populations in Northern Ireland as part of the peace process that ended the conflict there. So I say this isn't a federal system, but it is some, that is something that is being suggested by some campaigners at the moment. And that's because the, cons the current constitutional settlement looks unlikely to last as a result of the decision to leave the European Union or Brexit, as we tend to call it over here. And that's led to increasing demands for a new vote on Scottish independence. We had one in 2014, which narrowly agreed that Scotland would stay within the UK. Uh, and a border poll in Northern Ireland that could see Irish reunification 100 years after partition, when the Re Republic of Ireland became independent. So these things are being suggested. They may well happen. But uh, some people are actually suggesting that a, an explicitly federal system might be another possible solution as well to, uh, to stop short of, uh, of complete secession of the different parts of the United Kingdom. So you can see the constitutional settlement here in the UK is quite complex and it's under some pressure and that's leading to some changes. And that makes it both a fascinating challenge to report on for television news, but also quite complex too. Uh, and television news is still a really important source for people in the UK as a news source. So according to Ofcom, that's the government body that licenses and regulates broadcast television in the UK, around 75% of people say it's their most used source of news. That's despite the rise of the internet and social media. And television news has a really high level of trust as well. 71% of people say they trust it to be factual and accurate, and around 61% trust it to be impartial. Let's have a look at the situation in the States. According to point, the Pointer Media Trust survey, around 55% of Americans trust network news. That's better. There's better news at a local level, with 76% of people saying they trust it. But if you dig into the details, it becomes clear there's a split amongst voters. 82% of registered Democrats trust network news, just 28% of registered Republicans do. And the figures are even more stark for cable news. Just 20% of Democrats trust Fox News. 88% of them trust CNN. And while 76% of registered Republicans trust Fox, just 19% of them trust CNN. So the conclusion is clear. Whether you trust a particular type of US TV news depends on your existing political affiliation. But thus far, at least, that's not the case here in the UK. We've got relatively high levels of trust amongst both right-wing and left-wing voters. But as we'll see later, that might be changing. Well, let's think about why that might be the case. Well, one reason could be the way in which TV news is regulated in the UK. Broadcast journalists are bound by a legal duty to be impartial. They can't explicitly back any political party or movement. And there are quite strict rules during election campaigns that help to ensure a balance of coverage between everybody competing for election. The regulator Ofcom reviews coverage to ensure that the legal duty is met to be duly impartial and to ensure due weight of coverage. So what does that mean in practice? It means that reporters and producers can't cheerlead for one side or the other. And there's a plurality of views in reports and on programmes that everybody get running for election gets a fair bite of the cherry when it comes to coverage. The broadcasters have a duty to be accurate and factual, to be transparent about their sources. But this doesn't mean both sidedism balancing two competing visions when one is not credible 
That's due in part, that due part of the phrase, due impartiality and due weight of coverage, gives the broadcasters some editorial leeway to make decisions about how they interpret impartiality. And as we'll see later, in the age of social media, that can lead to some issues. But first, let's take a look at a fairly typical election report by ITV News, the biggest commercial TV network in the UK. This report was put together just before the last general election, about a week, the weekend before the last general election. And it's a good summary and a good introduction to what was happening uh, at, at, in, in that election, which took place in December 2019. So have a look at this and see what you think. The Tories took a risk today, putting a new chap on the phone bank. But Boris Johnson just couldn't get his computer to call anyone. Fortunately, the Chancellor managed to find a voter for him to talk to. Not that the message is a new one. We've got a deal that's ready to go. We can get it in by Christmas, uh, you know, before our viewers have even put the sprouts on, uh, we can have uh, our deal in the oven uh, and out again for its second reading in Parliament. We can be out by January the 31st, get Brexit done. Campaigning in North Wales today. Thank you. Jeremy Corbyn said Labour are still in with a chance. Many people only make up their minds how to vote in the last few days. They have a choice. A Tory government and a trade deal with the USA with all the damage that will do to our public services or a Labour government that's inclusive of the needs of all of our society. Even the Lib Dems agree they now look unlikely to form a government and their best chance to stop Brexit is by stopping Boris Johnson. Tactical voting uh, plays a role in elections because of the voting system uh, that we have and there will be large numbers of people that are looking at what is the best way to achieve the result they want. In so many parts of the country, uh, voting Liberal Democrat is going to be the way to stop Boris Johnson getting a majority. In fact, stopping the Conservatives has become a common refrain amongst the smaller parties. Um, I think it's fair to say feeling pretty upbeat and positive and optimistic about uh, the election on Thursday. But if people don't want to have Boris Johnson determining Scotland's future for the next five years, they've got to get out and vote SNP because that's the way to stop it. Which is why Boris Johnson is warning his party not to take their lead in the polls for granted. Of course the horses can still change places. Because even another hung parliament could kill off their latest Brexit deal. OK, Oops, sorry, I'll just uh, move that on. OK, so what can we learn from all this then? So the report has a, a balance of views with the leaders of the four largest parties all being interviewed. It doesn't provide any overt support for any political party, nor can we understand the journalist's own political views. But it does take account of what the journalist understands to be the real world situation that the Conservatives were consistently ahead in the polls. They look likely to win the election five days later. Uh, Labour leader at the time, Jeremy Corbyn, faces that framing during his interview clip. And of course, that is what happened. The Conservatives won their best election result since the 1980s, and the Labour Party went down to its worst defeat in decades. Broadly then, this report seems to support the view of British TV news being impartial and factually correct. But if one was to make a criticism of this, isn't it a bit dull? A little bit boring, even handed, yes, but lacking in excitement. And that is a criticism that is sometimes made of British TV's political news coverage. So let's take a look at a report by Channel 4 News. Now, Channel 4 is a smaller national network uh, and its news programme is different to the other bulletins. It's longer at an hour in length and it's more committed to explanation and analysis and providing context than the shorter half hour uh, news programmes. We're going to look at a report now that was made by their political correspondent, Michael Crick. It's actually quite long, so we're not going to watch the whole thing, but I will we'll cut to the crucial, crucial part of it. Uh, and this was made when Boris Johnson was campaigning to replace the then leader of the Conservative Party, Theresa May. It's been a kind of busy few, few years in the British politics, it has to be said. Uh, a few years before that, Johnson had been the key figure in the Vote Leave campaign that had won the referendum for Britain to leave the European Union. But that campaign was dogged by claims of appealing to racist and anti-immigrant attitudes among some voters. And that was something that Johnson was very keen to play down later on when he was trying to become the leader of the Conservative Party. But as you'll see, Channel 4 News didn't want to play ball. As Theresa May... I'm just gonna just move forward to the, to the relevant bit, just a second. And if an influx of Labour is being used 
not only to prevent an investment in capital equipment, but also in skills and in the prospects of young people, then we need to think carefully about how we control immigration. Time to ask about his record on immigration. Mr Johnson, haven't you been all over the place on immigration in the last five years? 2013, you described yourself as the most pro-immigration politician in Britain. Then we had the I referendum. Roughly, I think I said roughly the same just now. But anyway. In 20, 2016, the referendum, you and your chum uh, Dominic Cummings in the Vote Leave campaign suggested 80 million Turks would come to this country if we stayed in the EU, which was absurd then and is absurd now. And doesn't all of this show you'll say anything just to win an election, in this case, the Conservative leadership well, election? Well, uh, actually, um, I didn't say anything about, about Turkey in the... But, in well, the, that was the, I, I that was the campaign about, you led. Well, that, well, that was the Vote Leave you know, campaign you led. I didn't say anything about Turkey. And, and, and I think anybody who's followed my utterances over the last... Uh, 20 years will know that I've, I've always been in the camp of those who defend so and support. So do you disown those remarks then? Do you I, disown I, them? I, I, since I made no remarks, I can't, I can't no, disown them. but your campaign them. did. The Vote Leave campaign did. Well, I didn't make any remarks about Turkey. But do you, I, do you I, disown I, I, them? You were the leader of the Vote Leave campaign. You do me, you do, do me too much honour. I was, uh, I, was, I, was, I was happy to support Leave, and, and, I, and I do, and I, and I did. I happen to think that uh, immigration can be a wonderful thing for our country, but as I said uh, uh, time and time again, it's got to be controlled. Yet Johnson there today was strangely coy about his role in Vote Leave. He, of course, was their big figurehead. He toured regularly on their bus and served on the Vote Leave campaign committee. OK, so let's just leave that there, because as I say, this is this is quite long, but you, you get a bit of a oh, sorry, uh, you get a bit of a flavour there of the sorts of, uh, uh, of robust questioning that comes uh, from uh, from Channel 4 News. So so what we, might we take from this that we can understand that the British TV news then can hold the powerful to account that being impartial doesn't preclude challenging, aggressive reporting and questioning uh, of those in power. And also that there's no need to balance an accurate story with spurious justification from, from, from the subject. You don't need to sort of have somebody making some false claim if you're, if you're happy that what you're saying is factually correct. So, reasons to be positive then, possibly? Well, yes and no, because one of the effects of this kind of reporting has been that Channel 4 News has lost some trust amongst right-wing voters. We think back to that partisan stuff that I was saying earlier on about uh, American television news, we're seeing some effects that might be similar to that in the UK with some of our reporting too. So aggressive reporting has sparked that sense of unfairness amongst viewers, and that perhaps more significantly, the Conservative Party, who the party that John Boris Johnson leads, has also stopped some cooperation with Channel 4 News. It's not putting up politicians for studio-based interviews any longer. And partly this is in response to what Conservatives see as a pattern of biased reporting, uh, um, and, and also in response to a, to a speech that the broadcaster's head of news gave, calling Boris Johnson a known liar uh, just before the, uh, the uh, uh, 2019 general election took place. So the Conservatives have begun boycotting Channel 4 News, but also some other mainstream media outlets as well, which they could perceive as being unsympathetic to the party. Those boycotts have been partially successful um, uh, and have led to, to some political backlash. Um, now, during the, 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 the election, the Conservatives also said that the party would want to review Channel 4's licence agreement if Johnson was re-elected. And the party proposed looking at whether Channel 4's remit should be better focused so it is serving the public in the best way possible. The Conservatives have also made clear that they, wanted to they want to review the way in which the BBC is funded as well. At the moment, every household in the UK with a television has to pay for a licence fee and the proceeds of that pay for the BBC's radio, television and digital services. Uh, the BBC doesn't carry advertising here in the UK, but the other, the other networks do. Uh, and last year, we also had some stories emerge 
Times that quoted anonymous advisor to Boris Johnson as saying that Downing Street was not bluffing about the license fee. They said, we're having a consultation and we will whack it. Very mafiosi. Uh, they, those remarks are uh, widely thought to have been from Johnson's then chief advisor, Dominic Cummings, who's a sort of British Steve Bannon, uh, and he'd previously described the BBC as the mortal enemy of the Conservative Party. So we can see that under the British system of government licensing and regulation, while there may be benefits for public trust, there are also tensions between journalists and, and politicians. And the political party's desire to have sympathetic coverage sometimes trumps a commitment to balanced journalism. We don't have a, 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 an equivalent protection to the First Amendment here in the UK. So hard-nosed reporting carries political and also commercial risks for the, for the broadcasters. And it's worth saying, when we talk about this, this isn't an empty threat. It has happened before. Back in the 1980s, Thames Television, which was a local television station broadcasting in London, lost its license after falling out with uh, Margaret Thatcher's government over a documentary it had broadcast about a notorious incident uh, in the British colony of Gibraltar, where uh, special UK Special Forces soldiers killed three members of the provisional IRA who were, at the time, unarmed. So we've seen that some of the changes to the UK's constitutional settlement are putting pressure on TV's political journalists. And while that top-down pressure is being exerted, there's also bottom-up pressure coming too from users of social media. So the UK has become a more divided nation in recent years. According to research published by the King's College at London University, people identify less with political parties, but more with the issues they support. So for example, they, whether they voted to leave or remain in the European Union or whether they support or oppose Scottish independence. And we saw some of the impact of that in the general election in 2019, when the Conservatives were able to appeal to leave voters uh, in areas of the country that had previously voted for the Labour Party for decades. And because these positions are, are binary, it can be hard for supporters of one position or another to reach across the divide and find common ground with their opponents. So as the UK has become more divided, social media has become increasingly influential in public debate. As in other Western countries, people uh, um, are using social media to, to put forward passionate political positions, to unite with like-minded people, to give uh, movements momentum and share supportive messages. And as so often with social media debate, that discourse covers a spectrum of communication from polite and earnest to robust and aggressive. Some of it's satirical, it's mocking, some of it's bad faith, it's lies, it's untruth, and some of it's just abuse, some of it's all awful. And in many ways, this isn't really surprising, because at the moment, many people in the UK feel that politics is very high stakes. Even if you put aside the constitutional changes, which can affect people's core sense of identity, there's also the ongoing impact of the 2008 financial crisis. In the years since the, the bailout of the banks, the UK government has cut back public spending in order to pay off public debt, a policy widely referred to here as austerity. And that many people blame that for a rise in homelessness and hunger. And researchers have also found that around 100,000 people more than would be expected have died in the seven years after the Conservatives came, came to power. Now, for many on the, on the left of politics, that's seen as conclusive proof that those on the right support policies that actually end up killing people. And so opposition to those policies has become a matter, literally for some people, of life and death. It's incredibly high stakes for those people. So passions are running high and TV journalists covering political news have become frequent targets for politically engaged social media users. Now, perhaps the journalists, the political journalist who receives perhaps the most social media criticism is the BBC's political editor, Laura Kunzberg, as you can see here. She's a, she's a uniquely powerful person in the British media. Much of her reporting is done live on the very many British uh, BBC radio and television political programmes, uh, as well as on the main network news bulletins. You can literally wake up to her thoughts on the morning radio shows and go to bed listening to her analysis on the late night news bulletins and even put a podcast on with her, with her, her thoughts as well. And much of her role 
is to provide analysis and context to government decisions, something which more means that she's often required to frame and explain the decision making process. And consequently, she's often criticised for being too close to the government. And we see that criticism in the mainstream press, but it's on social media where that critique is most virulently made. And if you just search for her name, it brings up some really quite extreme reactions. There's a range of parody accounts, the most successful of which has more than 100,000 followers, and its tweets get thousands of retweets and likes. So what impact does all this have? Well, perhaps the most dramatic impact was visible at the Labour Party's uh, conference uh, in 2017, when Kunzberg had to be assigned a bodyguard to protect her. Now, it's not unusual for the BBC reporters to work with security specialists in hostile and environments like war zones, but it is pretty surprising that one needed them to attend a party political conference. But the overarching aim of all this invective is not to cause physical harm, it's to put pressure on the journalists to alter their reporting on an issue to bring it in line with the belief of the groups that the poster belongs to. So the BBC has become a convenient target for some of these groups, making, making strong binary arguments, the Eurosceptics, the Scottish nationalists, left-wingers, right-wingers, to name but a few. And all of this means that there's a big battle coming down the line. On the one side, there are those that think that the BBC and its reporting are either hostile to them or at least insufficiently supportive. And on the other, there are those that want to keep BBC reporting impartial and not allow it to be overtaken by the fight for party advantage. And it's going to be a big fight. Those who want change include people from across the political spectrum and include some of the most powerful people in the United Kingdom. Those who prefer the status quo include many people who think that there has to be some kind of reform and change to, to the way that politics is reported, more recognition of minority views, for example, or perhaps more oppositional framing. And the changes that are decided during the next few years will define TV political reporting for the next generation. And the changes may be similar to the way in which US TV political coverage changed in the wake of the abolition of the Fairness Doctrine back under President a uh, Reagan during the 1980s. Now, before I became a, a, an academic, I was a TV news producer, and we always looked to the states for inspiration when we were relaunching news or current affairs programmes. We wanted to see what the networks were doing and then what we could steal and, uh, and repurpose for the UK. But perhaps what happened following the abolition of the Fairness Doctrine holds a warning for us too, or at least a glimpse of one possible future. The rise of Fox News, of conservative talk radio, the alt-right. If the UK changes the way we regulate TV news, perhaps we'll see a mirror of the way some broadcasting has evolved in the States. And if that happens, perhaps we can expect to see public levels of trust in UK TV news mirror those uh, that, are, uh, that are, we see in the States with similar splits around the hot button issues. So I'm nearly coming to the end. Uh, so I thought I'd end with this. So sometimes when we're, we're covering politics, uh, it's, it, it's very easy to become rather self-obsessed and, and rather pompous. Uh, and it's a trap many of us uh, can easily fall into. But in the end, it's important to ask the powerful, difficult questions, even when they don't want to ask them. So I wanted to show you uh, this clip, which is from 2006, in which a BBC reporter called Nick Robinson asks President George W. Bush a question he doesn't want to hear about the progress of the war in Iraq. And as you'll see, it provokes a strong response from the president. Nick Robinson, BBC News. Mr. President, the Iraq study group described the situation in Iraq as grave and deteriorating. You said that the increase in attacks is unsettling. That will convince many people that you're still in denial about how bad things are in Iraq and question your sincerity about changing course. It's bad in Iraq. That help? <laughs> Why did it take others to say it before you've been willing to acknowledge oh, it to the I, world? You know, in all due respect, I've been saying a lot. I understand how tough it is, and I've been telling the American people how tough it is, and they know how tough it is. And the fundamental question is, uh, do we have a plan to achieve our objective? Are we willing to change as the enemy has changed? The, uh, and what Baker Hamilton uh, study has done is it shows a good idea as to how to go forward. What our Pentagon is doing is figuring out ways to go forward, all aiming to achieve our objective. Make no mistake about it. I understand how tough it is, sir. I talk to the families who die. I understand there's sectarian violence. I also understand that we're hunting down Al-Qaeda. 
on a regular basis, and we're bringing them to justice. I understand how hard our troops are working. I know how brave the men and women who wear the uniform are, and therefore they'll have the full support of this government. I understand what long deployments mean to wives and husbands and mothers and fathers, particularly as we come into a holiday season. I understand. And I have made it abundantly clear how tough it is. I also believe we're going to succeed. Oh, okay. So a few years later, Robinson reflected on that moment and what it means for impartial reporting. Robinson was the political editor of the BBC before Laura Kunzberg. He too faced questions about bias from viewers, although nothing with, with as much vitriol as Kunzberg suffers. When he was at university, he was a, a quite a prominent campaigner in right-wing student politics. Uh, and in the end, he concluded, impartiality is not about asking the questions that confirm what you already believe, but asking the questions that those in power have to be asked. That's our duty that we bear to our listeners and our viewers. It's not about being courtiers or becoming intimate with those who hold power. It's about asking the, the, asking the questions that need to be asked for those who cannot ask them for themselves. But as you'll hear, it doesn't always make us popular. Consider this thing called impartiality to be important enough that when I go to work, I actively try to ask questions which don't reflect what I think, but reflect what I think needs to be asked. So that I will, you know, I had a run-in which became quite well known with George Bush, uh, where I asked him whether he was in denial about the Iraq war. If you, uh, uh, he said, uh, he got very cross actually, I said, he said something about the Iraq war and I said, Mr. President, <clears throat> on the basis of what you said, some people will think you're in denial about the Iraq war and he said he pointed at me he was about as close to me I'm you and he's me here he said it's bad in Iraq sir will that do because he was seeming to deny it. and I said it won't it won't do at all no I didn't say I thought it won't do at all because I needed a long soundbite for the TV news and <laughs> that was far too short so I actually shouted out <clears throat> why didn't you say so before which produced an explosion from Bush, he started sort of pointing at me throughout the news conference. Now, if you had judged my views by what I thought at Oxford, you would have said I'd never have asked that question because I'd come from, as it were, a kind of right-wing perspective. So, therefore, I must be pro-America, I must be pro-war. I asked it because I thought that's the question that Bush needed to be asked. So, I don't find it difficult. The reason I said no and yes, the hardest thing is to deal with the bias you're not conscious of. It's your assumptions. Those are hard. And that's why you've got to have friends and colleagues and other people who say, are you sure you got that right? Have you thought of this? And if you don't constantly challenge yourself, which I try to do, you shouldn't be in journalism. Now, one last thing. Consider this thing called... Not having any luck with those videos, are we? So uh, there we go. I thought that's uh, quite a good moment to end uh, on that little reflection there from from Nick Robinson about why the what, what you've got to think about as far as impartiality when covering politics goes. Now, if there's any questions that anybody would like to ask, uh, now now is probably a good moment. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, and then hopefully I can I can actually see if anybody's put anything in in the Q and A or the chat. Right. <laughs> well, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one question that I had watching this was if 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 there's a change that's happening now, does it seem to be more like news is going to become more like the US situation is? And what are what do journalists think about that? Mm. So um, we, it's quite an interesting moment because um, the government absolutely is, is, is committed to, to changing. The government considers lots of uh, television news to be uh, inherently terribly lefty and, and biased against, uh, against the Conservative Party, and it wants to make changes. Um, there are two new news channels that are about to launch. 
Uh, one of them is being launched by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, it's not quite clear exactly how that's going to work, but uh, there's been lots of uh, discussion about whether that will be like be like Fox, uh, um, uh, Fox News. Um, I think that's probably not quite how it's going to end up being, but that's one one suggestion. Uh, and the other one is uh, is being launched by a, a group uh, who are um, explicitly hoping to challenge the the, the sort of kind of current conventions that sit around broadcast news and one of the things that they're sort of hoping to do is to sort of push back against this sense that uk news has to be impartial or uk tv news has to be impartial because our our newspapers are not our newspapers are, are really partisan much more so i think probably than than in the states um but uh, but the tv news that it has this regulatory it has by law to try to be to be neutral to try to be impartial so they're going to they're pushing back against that really quite hard even to the to the to the point where they're currently looking at um, uh, they've just appointed a new chairman for the BBC, who's a very big uh, donor to the Conservative Party, who's just been put into place. He's due to start work imminently, I think, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and they are looking to replace the the chairman of Ofcom, the body that that oversees the regulation uh, of the of the of the uh, television news as well. And the the name that keeps being talked about is the editor of a very right wing uh, tabloid, uh, who um, uh, has uh, has long thought that the BBC is a is a nest of vipers that needs to be sorted out so uh so yes there's a lot of pressure being exerted by the government at the moment for change uh, and it's quite likely i think that some of that change will take place uh, it's not at all clear that uh that um the, the the status quo will survive without being altered at the moment i think it is quite likely that there will be some change uh, and quite how that's all going to, uh, to to pan out is not at all clear it is worth saying though that the government has been talking very aggressively about this over the last 18 months but actually the covid crisis has led to a big rise in uh, in audiences for television news here in the uk um and um and lots of people seeking it out wanting trusted information uh, you know obviously we have lots of problems with misinformation and disinformation and fake news on, uh, on on social media so lots of new audiences coming to the to the television programs and radio programs looking for trusted information and maybe that's slightly taking the wind out of the government's sails slightly it may be that they're now thinking actually that's going to make things a little bit more difficult but this fight has still got a way to run yet okay all right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. And, um, you know, we, we really appreciate you. And <laughs> Well, that's very kind of you, Jackie. I hope everybody found it interesting uh, and, and not too boring and distant. I hope, uh, hopefully, hopefully it wasn't. Uh, uh, it is uh, an exciting moment, uh, at least. Well, and it's very different from what we have here. So it's a whole different point of view. And, and so I think that's great for our teachers and students to be able to have a little view into a different, a different system. So anyway, we, we appreciate you. And um, oh, here's, here's the question. All right. This is okay. Uh, what news sources did you use when you used to report? Uh, Malcolm is asking. So, um, well, all, all sorts. I mean, obviously, the the the, the best ones to use are, are, are people that you know, face to face sources, uh, people that can tell you about stories and and who can who can give you insight into what's happening in the world. But also, we would use um, uh, news agencies as well. So we would use things like the Associated Press. Uh, we have a version of, uh, of that in the UK as well, called the Press Association. Uh, and, and Reuters as well, and we would get information from those sorts of places too. But but obviously the the, the first place to start is is through the the shoe level of reporting that you can do uh, to create your own uh, your own contacts. And when you're covering political news, that means being embedded in the in the political process in the parties. Uh, whenever you talk to political journalists of long standing, they will often say, you know, the the people that I met who were new members of Parliament who had come in and and didn't know anything, and they were all very green. Uh, those people, if you if you stay reporting politics for long enough, will eventually become the people in power. Uh, cultivate them when you when you're uh, when you're when they're young and uh, and not very experienced, and, and perhaps you are too. So all of those things are really useful. It's the human sources though that are always going to make the stories better. Thank you for that question. That was a great one. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up? All right. 
Well, thank you again. And um, maybe, maybe next year you can come in person. Well, that would be lovely. I would really like that. Uh, <laughs>